That doesn't count all the uh, Somali and Eritrean colonial troops to add into the mix. And, um, and the rest of the world was like, you know, we, you know, nothing's worse than war. Let's figure this out. Oh, it can't be that bad. The truth of the matter was, was, was that with a couple of exceptions, uh, Ethiopia was alone. Because what's, it, what's happening here is, everybody, this is 34 going into 35. Hitler hasn't broken the Treaty of Versailles. Hitler hasn't militarized the Rhineland. Hitler hasn't begun open um, a militarization of his armed forces. As a matter of fact, in July of 34, Nazis in Austria tried to steal Austria and take over Austria and give it to Hitler. They failed, and they failed in part because Mussolini mobilized the Italian army, put it on the Austrian border, and said to the Nazis, get out. Austrian independence is guaranteed by Italy. Remember, he's been, Mussolini's been dictator for 12 years. Hitler's been around by that time for a year and a half. And Hitler backed down. So what happens is, especially the French and the British were like, you know, hey, we don't want to really stand with Ethiopia because we do will antagonize Italy, and Italy could be a great counterbalance against Hitler. I mean, it's really, it's very cold and calculating, but it, it had, there's a, there's a reason to it. On the other hand, you're turning your back on an independent country that's about to get attacked by a fascist dictatorship, and that has its own problems, doesn't it? Right? In fact, it was really interesting. There was even this one British, French, they tried to come up with this idea where, hey, Haile Selassie, give the Italians two-thirds of your country, and the other third can be a rump and a protectorate to the Italians, and that way we won't have a war. And Haile Selassie said no, but even better, Mussolini said no. I want the whole thing. <laughs> I'm going to get the whole thing. I'm going to avenge Edouard. You know, I don't want I don't want two thirds when I can get all. And I said it's really interesting too. The French guy that came up with this was Pierre Laval, the leader of Vichy France, who goes before a firing squad. And the British guy that came up with his last name was Hoare. H O A R E. So it's it's my favorite, favorite diplomatic endeavor in the entirety of mankind. It's Hoare and Laval. There you go. And it <laughs> failed. It totally failed. So eventually what will happen is is finally in September, uh, 20th September, 1935, Mussolini, uh, Haile Selassie will submit to the reality and he will call for a mobilization of his people. All men and boys able to carry a spear go to Addis Ababa. Every married man will bring his wife to cook and wash for him. Every unmarried man will bring an unmarried woman he can find to cook and wash for him. Women with babies, the blind, and those too aged and infirm to carry a spear are excused. Anyone found at home after this, receiving this order will be hanged. <laughs> so, in pretty short order, Haile Selassie is able to put forth an army. This is the regular army. These are brave men. Some did only have spear, shield, and sword. Most, though, had rifles. I thought it was really interesting in this picture. If you look really carefully, a lot of them carried pistols, too, which is, I think, not an easy thing to do in a, in, a, in a world that's in the middle of a depression. But those guys are actually pretty well armed. And he can actually, Haile Selassie can probably bring 500,000 men to the battle eventually in this, because, again, it's still a feudal levy. The problem is, is that while the Italians will only have about 300,000 plus men, this time the Italians have it all over the Ethiopians in terms of technology. They will have 2,000 modern artillery pieces versus 234 antiquated artillery pieces. They will have thousands upon thousands of machine guns. The Ethiopians will have 1,200 machine guns. The Italians will bring in um, 600 airplanes, the Italians have, the Ethiopians have 13 and four <coughs> pilots. The, um, uh, you know, the Italians will have radios, and so they'll be able to coordinate on the battlefield, whereas most of the time the, Italian, the Ethiopians will have runners. That's not going to turn out very well. The Italians will bring in like 300 tanks and armored cars, well, tankettes and armored cars and stuff. Flamethrowers, they're just going to have 
every advantage in terms of technology. And this time, the Italians, because of with gold and with uh, rivalries and bitterness and envies, what they will do is, is they will get various um, Ethiopian chieftains and tribes to either sit on the sideline or change sides. Especially up in, with the Tigrayans, which of course, you know, remember just a couple of years ago, there was a massive civil war up there between the Ethiopian government and the Tigrayans today. It's an old and long-running feud. So the Italians build up, the, Ethi the Ethiopians mobilize. Uh, the, of course, the Italians also have, you know, the, uh, the Somali and Eritrean and Iscariots. They even got, they brought Libyan Iscariots down from their college. They even got some, some Yemenis to join the Italian effort just to kill Ethiopians. You know, it's just, it's, well, you know, the truth is, and it's really sad, but you can name me almost any group in the world, and I can tell you another group that hates them to the point of murder. And so, add the Yemenis into that calculation too, if you will. The Italians also had a group of Belgian fascists, which is just, uh, that is, it's just like on another plane there. And then you have the, Al and please forgive me everyone, the Alistero, who were Italians from Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay, who are like, ooh, it's wartime, adventure, I'm gonna go fight for my people on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, and the other side of the, the African continent. But the reality of it is, is what's gonna happen is, is that the war is coming. Now, I meant to tell you about these guys, this is the Kabur Zabanga. Uh, Haile Selassie had six battalions of, of European trained and, uh, and equipped and organized troops as an Imperial Guard. And they are as ever been as good as anything the Italians could, could bring to the battle, but it's only six battalions and in the end it won't be enough. <coughs> uh, the Italians up in Eritrea, this fellow named Emilio de Bono, he'll be in charge there and down in Somalia, Somaliland. There will be Rudolfo Graziani, who is a very capable man in his own way, very ruthless. Gave us the most infamous quote from the Ethiopian con conquest of Ethiopia. Mussolini will have Ethiopia with or without the Ethiopians. <laughs> so, yeah. So you have Italian infantry, you have Italian artillery, you have the Regio Aeronautica, the Italian Air Force, oops, and you have Italian armor. Now this, these aren't, these aren't the, the greatest little vehicles, but you know, Italians have none. And I, I say this picture particularly because this is so interesting that you really can't see it from here. But you see that little symbol on the side that's got looks like a, like a like a double horn or whatever, the circle in the middle. Maybe you can see it. For those who are in the front row, you know how like tankers like to name their tanks, like maybe an inside joke of their best gal or something to intimidate the enemy or whatever. Look what look what that tankette is called. It's called Adua. That's what they named their tank at. A-D-U-A, which is the Italian spelling for the battle. Revenge. And it's coming. <coughs> coming in the form of a Fiat and Saldo tank yet. So what happens is, is without a declaration of war on the 3rd of October 1935, the Bono invades down into uh, Ethiopia, basically following the same pathway as uh, Baratiari did. In fact, they got to Adowa on the 6th of October. So there's your redemption. There's the, the, the stain has been removed. And early on, the Italians won these early struggles because, like I said, they brought really superior firepower to there. They brought a better level of technology. The problem was, was the same thing that faced, the De Bono that faced uh, Baratiari was once you get into Ethiopia, the 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 net the, uh, the the transportation network falls apart, and so what happened was was very quickly the Italian advance sort of ground to a halt because logistics began to break down, and the Ethiopians are up in these this very rough, hilly, almost mountainous terrain, and so the Italians get in there, and then they sort of roll to a stop. And in the meantime, Graziani 
takes his forces and he starts going into the, and this was a lot more successful because this is more like desert and flatlands. In fact, Graziani even organized, this was very modern. He organized a mechanized unit or motorized unit. He had infantry and trucks and he had uh, artillery pulled by trucks and they had camel troops and cavalry and some armored cars and planes flying overhead with radio communications and everything. And, um, and it, he actually kind of, Graziano kind of created like an Italian blitzkrieg before the Germans, which is kind of an interesting uh, point to it all. But what happens is though, is the Bono basically runs out of steam for a variety of reasons. And then, starting on the 15th of December and going for an entire month, and you can see all those brown arrows heading up to meet the blue arrows. Haile Selassie ordered a counterattack, and from the 15th of December to the 20th of January, the uh, uh, Ethiopian army smashed into the Italian armies. 190,000 men versus 125,000 men. 125,000 men have the better technology, but the 190,000 men are pretty motivated, and it was a it was a series of really really fierce battles, and the losses were pretty much like one to one most of the time. The problem was, was that being on the tack is a lot harder business. You know, oh, we got to run the mountains. Well, no, you're up out of the mountains, coming out in the open to get to the enemy. They can see you. They have airplanes. They have artillery. And then the Italians played their trump card. They had poison gas. The big one was, so there was, there was talk of using phosgene, but the big one was mustard gas. And you could deliver it from artillery shell, the, from the bombs of a plane, but actually eventually the Italians even had some planes that could dispense it like a crop duster. And the problem is with mustard gas is it's not an asphyxiant. It doesn't get in your lungs and create water like chlorine or phosgene. It is a, it is a, uh, it's a, it, it's a, it's a burn. It creates a chemical burn and it sticks to your skin. And so what happens, instead of an asphyxiant, it's a blister agent. And you can get second, even what we get things like what we, we would consider second degree burn or worse from this stuff. And what's even worse is it's real viscous and it sticks. The, the ones like chlorine gas, as soon as you get a good breeze, most of it dissipates. But the, but the yeah, if it's not here, that's right. And, but the mustard gas will stick to surfaces and you can walk by a week later, and I don't know if you noticed the pictures of the Ethiopian soldiers, but even his uh, Kebura Zabanga, they're, they're, they're barefoot. So th this trail has got mustard gas residue all over it, and the soldiers walk through, they're hobbled, they're done. And so what happened was, was the Italians started using this gas on the Ethiopians, and they started, the Ethiopian attacks start to peter out. And then, and what we find is, is that when the, the Italians start using the mustard gas, the casualty ratios go to almost 10 to 1 in a lot of places. And then it's like the Italians are pretty much unstoppable at that point. Because not only do you cause all these losses, all these wounded men, and all this trouble, uh, but also on top of all of that, it's very demoralizing that you can't get back at this enemy who's dispensing this, you know, this weapon against you, that, which you have no, because I mean a gas mask. I mean you don't want to get mustard gas in your lungs because it'll, it'll blister your lungs and then you're even worse. But but it just has to get on your skin and you know and you're in all sorts of trouble. You're in all sorts of hurt. So what will happen is is two things. In January, as the Ethiopian counterattacks peter out, this man is going to replace General De Bono. De Bono was considered too cautious, too, too incapable, his results were too meager. And this is Pietro Badoglio, very famous or infamous man at the time of Mussolini's fall. This is the guy that's going to help dethrone Mussolini and take, Mus and take Italy out of the war, which is really interesting. But in 1935, he's a loyal and doodle serpent of Victor Emmanuel III. And, and he comes in and he is an artillery man by trade. He's very methodical and, he, and, and so he gets everything, kind of like Montgomery, gets everything lined up and then when he hits, 
and it's pretty hard to resist. So what you will see is, is starting in late January and going all the way to the beginning of May, you see all those red cross swords up at the top? And you see all those green arrows heading south? Basically what's going to happen is, is Badoglio is going to bring the army to bear. He is going to soften up the Ethiopians with massive artillery barrages, aerial barrages, poison gas. Only the very first battle, this one on the side, Amba Aradam. And, Andre, how do you say it in Italian? Amba Amparadam. Yeah, um, okay, thank you. And it means a chaotic mess. The fur and it entered Italian usage from this moment in time. The very first battle was still about a one-to-one. -one. The Italians and the uh, their colonial troops had a very hard time with the Ethiopians. But after that battle, all the other little cross swords were just routes for the Ethiopians. They were just they were just slaughters. If you go online and look at the individual battles, the casualty rates are five, ten to one. And, and the survivors are just like, we just have to give it up. Until eventually, at the beginning of May, Haile Selassie, oh, I'm sorry, no, 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 no. At the end of March, beginning of April, Haile Selassie, he had the last major army in the field. He marched forward. He brought his, his Imperial Guard with him, met the Italians. They fought really, really hard. And in the end, they too were overborne. And the Italians just marched further south. And in the meantime, you can see all the, see how for much further the Italians out of Somaliland had done. And they they look at how far they went. And again, it was just like this was almost sort of like an Italian blitzkrieg. In a lot of places, in, in, in there, Graziani was slowed down by the by weather, by rain and stuff like that, as opposed to organized resistance. Until finally, you'll get. But in the Italian press, they called it the March of the Iron Will. And what will happen is, is that last big green arrow that heads down to Addis Ababa. And what you have with the March of the Iron Will is Bandoglio gets to ride into Addis Ababa on horseback. The conquering hero, Ethiopia, has been felt. And in the meantime, Haile Selassie and his family go into exile. They, they went first to um, French Somaliland, which of course was neutral territory and nobody could mess with them there, but the Italians weren't about to mess with them there, and he left. It's interesting, it says Jerusalem, that's actually Haifa. Uh, that's the Jerusalem station to take you, train to Jerusalem. But, he, but the British took him, the French gave him refuge, and then the British, the Royal Navy took him out. And basically what will happen is, is Haile Selassie will spend the next several years in Great Britain in exile. Um, how the world responds to all this? Well, it was sort of like the reality of it was, was that Ethiopia is conquered. Um, not much more we could say or do about that. And it's just sort of like, it's just sort of, it's a shame and you know, it's the way of the world, and, you know, the law of the claw, survival of the fittest, however you want to put it. But the reality of it was, was that uh, Mussolini and the Italian army had conquered Ethiopia. A few countries, uh, USA, Soviet Union, Mexico, New Zealand, Canada, and, and nationalist China, oh, and Republican Spain, that's another story moment, just a moment. And they refused to recognize it, but that but the, but the reality of it was was that it happened. Um, and that's another thing. It's just like right as this was wrapping up, mid July 1936, the Spanish Civil War begins. So even if Ethiopia was on the front pages or in people's minds, in very short order, now the Spanish Civil War is an even larger conflict with even larger consequences that is on everybody's, you know, mind. And of course, what also comes out of this was in the last day of June of 1936, Hadi Selassie addressed the League of Nations. And it's interesting, he, he spoke to them in Amharic. He knew English, he knew French, but he spoke to them in his native language and they had translated. And it's really interesting, right before, does anybody know the story? Right before he started to speak, a bunch of Italian journalists up in the gallery started whistling, catcalling, and throwing insults at him. Basically, the heckler's veto 
By the way, look it up. Heckler's veto is not for it's not free speech, so don't ever think that it is. And they actually had to call the sergeant of arms and law enforcement to forcibly eject these fellows from the building. So, and you can go online, and it's actually on the newsreels. You can go online and see this on the newsreels <coughs> of when it happened. But he gave a speech where he said, you know, the League of Nation really needs to do something about this or you're not going to make it. And I love it. I just have one line to quote from it, and it's a good one. He said, today it is us. It will be you tomorrow. Oops. <laughs> Pretty much nailed that. So, yeah, so Ethiopia had fallen, and Mussolini had his uh, Africa <laughs> Orientale Italiana. And um, it's interesting, Victor Emmanuel III actually took the title um, Emperor of Ethiopia, but only the Germans and the Italians who ever used it, but that's interesting. Uh, the 1st of June, they turned this into one big block, so you see, yeah, look how much they gave all that Somali, all that land to the Somalis as sort of a uh, reward for their services. You see Eritrea was massively expanded, but turned it into four regions. And then they went about doing their whole white man's burden, you know, colonialization, civil, civilizing movement of the whole nine yards. So they, they put an end to slavery. And they took to building infrastructure and they took to organizing education and, 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 and hospitals and basically, you know, you know, general health and all that kind of stuff. But it's also interesting, they made it a point to favor the Somalis and the Eritreans. They favored the Muslim parts of the population to just sort of kind of keep the Ethiopians in line. But they built railroads and roads and airports. This is really interesting. They they uh, they they put a lot of, put a lot of time and effort to it. They even had a um, the Bank of Rome did this like um, the vetimicum. It means sort of like uh, keep it at hand, like a travel guide for you know AOI. And there's the elephant and there's the, uh, <laughs> the tropical palm. But this is downtown Addis Ababa. They built this massive. Uh, structure to help jumpstart electrification in, in Ethiopia. So hospitals, schools, roads, railroads, airports, they came up with the uh, Linea de Imperiale and you could actually go by plane from Rome to Addis Ababa. Of course if this was remember in the 20s and 30s Italy was one of the cutting edge nations for aviation and so this, they made that part of the story too they um, encouraged colonization, and they also, while simultaneously trying to put down the last bits of resistance. The, uh, the last organized resistance for the Ethiopians came, uh, the last army in the field or band in the field surrendered in February of 1937. But the truth of the matter was, was that it was a lot nastier than that for several reasons. The first of all, the first viceroy of AOI was Graziani. And so he was, you know, he was a man who's gonna, he was in a man in a hurry, he was a man who's gonna get the job done. So you get the fact, you know, what you have is is that, you know, the Ethiopians, a lot of Ethiopians, they took to guerrilla warfare, they took to partisan warfare. They fought from the shadows because they couldn't fight out in the open anymore. And you know, and these partisan, anti-partisan operations, it is the dirtiest, and it's the nastiest kind of war anybody can find themselves in. And it certainly was the case here. There was a lot of brutality, a lot of summary executions. There was this one group called the Black Lions, who were Ethiopian intellectuals had been trained in the West, and they are all pretty much arrested and executed. Uh, there was uh, the Ethiopians had a, they called them the Patriots. They had, a, they had a resistance movement out of the countryside that the Italians fought against with, with their colonial troops with, with equal ferocity. A lot of people don't know this, but there was even two concentration camps in Ethiopia set up by Graziani. Now, these weren't like death camps like you would see like in Auschwitz, but they were basically what Dachau was originally. They were concentration camps, they were prison camps for political opposition. 
And so those who did not immediately get executed found themselves dumped into these two camps and they were in really bad spots. And it's really interesting. The Italians say, well, they were bad, but about only about 10% of the prisoners died. And the Ethiopians said, no, I'm pretty sure about 50% of the prisoners died. But they were in bad places in terms of health and well-being and rations were thin to say the least and discipline was brutal. So the reality of it is the Italians come in and they conquer and they start reorganizing everything and the civilizing nation, but of course they are still conquerors and they are still being resisted. Um, the biggest resistance came in late February 37. A couple of Eritreans, believe it or not, tried to kill Graziani with a bunch of hand grenades. Wounded him, didn't kill him, but then it grew even worse. And Graziani is actually known in Ethiopian history as the butcher of Ethiopia. But he was so heavy handed and he was so butcherly in his methods, uh, the Italians, oh, I missed this one picture, I'm sorry, this is another part of the conquest. Here are three um, Ethiopian noblemen paying their allegiance to Il Duce in 1937. Kind of interesting. But what you have here is he is replaced by the Duke of Aosta an actual member of the royal family, military man, and comes in and says, brutality is not going to win over the Ethiopians. We have to be civilized and humane with them. And so he pulls way back on the repression. And by 1939, by about the time of the Second World War breaking out, probably 90% of Ethiopia was pacified. So there were some people that say that, you know, the velvet glove works better than the mailed fist. And that was, his, that was his, his method and his operation and his motive through his time. So by 1940, you know, uh, AOI has got, you know, colonists and productivity and modernization and pacification. And then Italy's in the war. And what's going to happen is, is that the Duke of Aosta is going to find himself squaring off with Archibald Wavell. He's the British commander in this region. He's in charge of the Middle East and um, the Near East and East Africa. And these two men, Aosta for the Italians and Wavell for the British, are going to be getting ready to spar with each other. Italy declared war on France and Great Britain on the 10th of June, 1940. Italy stayed out of the war for the first nine months. But as France was falling, Mussolini thought he saw his opportunity, and he took it. Turned out it was a poor choice in the long strategic run. So, now the war is going to come to uh, Africa, Orientale, Italiana. But it's interesting, the first blow is going to be struck by the Italians. In August of 1940, the Italians, the black arrows there, invaded British Somaliland, which is between Italian Somaliland and French Somaliland. There's Italian Somaliland here on the right, and there's French Somaliland up there we see where it says Djibouti. 25,000 Italians with all sorts of instruments of war roll in, 5,000 British saying we can't win this, and you see the big red arrow. They did their own little Dunkirk out of the port of Barbera and went back over to the other side, to the Arabian Peninsula, away from the Italians. In fact, this is the only bit of the British Empire the Italians conquered in World War II. But they conquered it. They conquered British Somaliland. But after that, the Italians sort of went dormant. They sort of just was like, well, you know, we're cut off from Italy because the British had the Suez Canal and the Royal Navy. Uh, and the Italians, they, they had to kind of conserve their weapons and their fuel, and so they kind of went quiet. I mean, they had attacked down by the Kenyan border, the attack at the Sudanese border. Some Italians thought, we'll march through Sudan up to take Alexandria from the south and all this stuff. And, and, and there was some fighting, and, 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 and around the Sudanese border, the Italians gave as good as they got, but then they went strategically inert, and it was almost like, well, we just got to hold on until the Germans and the Italians, or the Axis 